Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Wednesday, August 26th, 9.30 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Wednesday's our campaign discussion day. Sometimes I focus on my own campaign of Grimwald, but... Today, uh, we're doing sort of a general stuff. We're taking a second look, or a look at, a continued look, at the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide Sample Dungeon. We started talking about it last week. The 1E AD&D DMG Sample Dungeon and You, Part 2. Makes it exciting that way, right? When you say it like that. And that's what you want. Thrill a minute here on the OK Grognard Show. So, that's exciting. What else is new? Well, as always, I like to mention from time to time. As always, from time to time. That doesn't make sense. I like to mention that when I started playing in 74... It was the original three little booklets with some miscellaneous stuff from the other, some of the stuff from Greyhawk, for instance, and other places, but not a ton of it. It's mainly the three little books until the Player's Handbook came out in, well, the Monster Manual came out in 77. Then the Player's Handbook in 78, and the DMG in 79. And as those things came out, of course it was easy with the Monster Manual. You had some stats that were more detailed than stuff from original D&D, but you added them in. Most people ignored something or other from everything at some point. Whatever was convenient when you were running a game and kept it exciting was the important part. So, there you go. In any event, very exciting that uh, stuff was coming out. There was new stuff. There was more stuff. Keeping it fresh. That Monster Manual, of course. It was a good idea releasing that first. I think if they had released the DMG first, it would have been somewhat overwhelming course there were articles in the dragon or you know it's hard to remember when uh, strategic review ended and dragon began but either way there were articles as uh, as they were working up toward getting first edition ready and announcing it and releasing it so there were some uh, cushions to the blow and uh you picked up on stuff as you went. Everybody had their own way of adding stuff in. And of course, there were other pocket campaigns, other people playing games here and there that uh, would help make would help uh, make things more understandable to. Uh, you know, if you didn't get this one part and somebody else didn't get this other part, you know, you'd you'd, uh, you'd consult with one another as DMs or as players, and eventually everything would make sense. So, but the D, but the Monster Manual was the natural first thing to come out because there was so, stuff in there you could just add in right away to your games, and that was cool. Of course, the basic stuff was coming out too. But since we just stuck with original at first, uh, our campaigns basically became that, you know. Original plus advanced is essentially what we were playing without uh, without really using any basics. You know, it's quite possible, though, that one of the other DMs in our group, because uh, most people took a hand behind them, took a... A bit of time behind the screen at one point or another. Um, Jerry was probably our main DM. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I DM probably not as much, but uh, 
second, and then there was a long drop off before our third or fourth, who would just, you know, maybe once a year or something, I don't know. But everybody would like to try it, right? Because uh, grass is always greener on the other side of the screen till you get back there. Some people think uh, it's so easy. So they want to jump back there. And, you know, it can be easy. If you're uh, good at it and you really enjoy it, it's going to seem easier for sure. But uh, but there's work to do back there. And players that think it's a, a real cakewalk or that you're, you know, doing it for ulterior motives or whatever aren't really thinking it through. In any event... Original plus advanced. The player's handbook came out next, and that, of course, had uh, had uh, character classes and stuff, and it gave you equipment, so you had a good, you know, nice list of stuff, and uh, kind of figured out, okay, uh, uh, the economy's changing a little bit because some of the numbers in the uh, equipment costs were fairly different from original. But one of the best parts of original D&D, I think, one of the uh, most frequently, uh, one of the most pleasing parts for someone who was uh, running games uh, was the uh, sample dungeon in the third little booklet, right? Underworld of Wilderness. Uh, Because once you read that, you had a pretty good idea of what was going on and how to run a game and everything else you could kind of extrapolate from that. Um, So too, when we look at the uh, expanded or uh, the fresh sample dungeon that was being shared in the first edition DMG, well, at that point, now we're talking on steroids, right? Now, we looked over, we read through some of this stuff last week. We wanted to get a handle on the game from that standpoint, right? Um... I'm not sure where we started. We did not start there. I guess we were... I guess we really were just looking at these right away. And we had a lot of, a lot to talk about when it came to uh, the Wandering Monsters. Because we were trying to think of them, discuss them contextually. Contextually. Within... And that's, you know... Morning, Ink Dweller. That's the point, right? To um, be able to uh, have a wandering monster make some sort of sense within an adventure. uh, Which is why you create these wandering monster tables. So that they fit. Not just thematically. I mean, yeah, you don't want something jarring popping out of a box. And just seeming out of left field. And I mean, there are times where that is the intention. No doubt about it. There are times when uh, getting something uh, totally out of left field is is the goal. But these all fit with what's already in there. Let's look at some stuff. And... Um, We should have a quick look. You know what? Actually, I just want to take us over here and look at the dungeon. You can see that there's a staircase down over here. And I point that out right away because I want to look at this uh, map um, with a sense of where you're going to wind up, right? Um... You know, I'm not even a million percent sure that that's a staircase down. We do have a staircase down over here on the left, behind a secret door. And it's one of those tricky secret doors where 
If you open it one way, it goes to the left. If you open it the other way, it goes to the right. And you don't necessarily know about both. You might have only learned one way of opening it, which gives you access to this place on the right rather than the left. Pretty nifty. Uh, other secret doors. There's one down here a bit to the right and below. If you can see where I'm pointing is, uh, you know what, let's do this. A couple of concealed doors, useful, but you can still get around to that same area, right? Not completely closed off. Likewise, down here, secret door here. Now, here's one of those tricky things, campaign-wise, that's worth noting. If I have a hallway that just ends... This one on the left, uh, in the lower right corner, <clears throat> excuse me, the one straight ahead, these two here. If I have a hallway that just ends, and it's the only one, and I put a secret door at the end of it, I fully expect that to be found. I have one, two, three, four, five hallways that just end in a kind of a closed area, short area, small area, and only one of them has a door at the end. Do they search everywhere? Well, it's going to take time, right? 10 minutes a 10 foot square. And if you just search the ends of those and you don't find anything, we're talking 40 minutes right there, right? Oop, sorry about that on the mic. Anyway, um, Yep, 10-foot squares. Yeah, in first edition. That's why you have these narrow ones. Those are not two-and-a-half-foot-wide hallways. Those are five-foot-wides right there. You had to... Uh, and you can even see this was hand-drawn, right? Well, of course, it was 1970s. But um, not drawn on a drafting table. That line's not very straight. There's a little... Look at this one here. A little bit of a ink error right this one over here in the uh, concealed hallway not completely clean so this wasn't done on a drafting table necessarily or at least it wasn't you know sanitized for publication complete without any errors looking around further I like that little pit in the center of the room what's going on with that um look at this little hallway or look at this little opening over here Right? There's a wall, there's a door on either side of it leading to the same room. A little bizarre. There's another concealed door, and you can get to that by either way. You can go through here. There's a secret door there that gets you back into this area quicker than if you came down this way and had to find your way through or use the concealed door to get in here. Right? But this is a part of the way forward. There's an alternate route over this way like these openings with the block in the center mixes it up a little bit creates a room without having to have doors on it so you could put things in there that theoretically could not open doors that's worth uh there's a campaign i or tip there uh opposite doors right but or rather uh Staggered, zigzaggy pattern on the doors on this hallway here. Prisony, prisony type thing. Here's that classic room with the thing. We'll get into that description in just a bit. We're just getting an idea of the map. And I started at the bottom and then moved to the top. Notice this secret trap door and a bit of a tunnel underneath from floor to floor. What's the point of that? Doors opposite. Long room here. Or 20 foot wide hallway. Hmm. Like I said, secret door A, B, and C. Use those letters to denote special things to A and B. There you go. All right. Well, there you are then. So. Monastery Cellars and Secret Crypts.
excuse me, entry chamber. You know, I should probably just move this over here. Couple sneezes there, pardon me. Entry chamber is that number one room with the A, B, and C in it. Remember with the C down by the doorway, the B in the corner. <laughs> okay. Hey, Yoda Stein, how you doing, buddy? Number one was the entry chamber. A damp, vaulted... Enough of that with the... Man, on a sneeze and tear there. Pardon me, everybody. I went to the... I got to use my... Um, I got to use my... I got to use my technical difficulty screen. I don't get to use that too often. And, uh, technically it was, well, I guess it's, man, that's like seven, and I even took a break. All right, <clears throat> let's get back to it. One more time. Whew. Well, this is fun. I'm going to have to subtitle the name of this episode. The sneezing episode. Wow. All right. Number one, entry chamber. A damp and vaulted chamber, 30 foot square. And arched to a 20 foot high center roof. All right, arches begin at eight foot and meet at a domed peak. All right, meet at a domed peak. Walls are cut stone block, floor is rough. All right, do I have this correct now? Let me read this section one more time. Entry chamber, a damp and vaulted chamber, 30 foot square and arched to a 20 foot high center roof. Arches begin at eight feet. Arches begin at eight feet and meet at a domed peak. Walls are cut black stone. Floor is rough, thick webs hide, ceiling. Man, is that what, like 12? That's crazy. I'm kind of glad I got it on video. I don't think I've ever sneezed that many times in a row. See A and B below. A, large spider. A, C, 8, move. 
6 inches or 15 inches. Thirteen for those keeping score. Hit dice. One plus one. Hit point six. There are also nine one hit point young spiders hiding in the upper part of the webs. This monster lurks directly over a central litter of husks. Skin, bones, and its own castings. Awaiting new victims to drop upon. It will always attack by surprise unless the webs it is in are burned, which will do three hit points of damage to the spider and kill the young. There are 19 silver pieces in the litter on the ground, while a goblin skull there has a 50 gold piece garnet inside which will only be noticed if the skull is picked up and examined. Let's look that over a little more closely. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. All right, everybody, let's see if we can get back through this. <laughs> Thanks for staying with me. Sorry for the delay. Anyway, large spider, we got all those details. What do we want to know? Or what else can we glean from that? Well, uh, let's talk about a couple things here. First off... It's interesting that a spider, who is a pretty dangerous creature for a first level group to run into, is in the first level room, the uh, first first level room of a complex. So... While the young spiders theoretically can't do any harm, there are nine of them, and they're there for <clears throat> they're there for uh, they're le there to lend some uh, realism to the uh, to the description, right? I mean, spiders have young. It's going to happen. And where do spiders come from? You know, if somebody says, well, where'd this spider come from? Well, you say, same place the little ones came from, their mom. <laughs> In any event, uh, looking up there, always surprise, one plus one hit points, only six hit points. That's not huge. AC8, pretty easy to hit. Um, it's large. They don't mention poison in the description here. So, I don't know if that gets included or not. Uh, that's a good question. I should double check. Because now I'm curious, right? And I got my books right here, so... Where is my... Oh. Ah. Good old monster manual. We'll just go to the section on spiders. Now, obviously, because of the way the entrance is to this place, anything can just come in and come out. So it's getting plenty of food where it is. And it's not trapped. It doesn't have to... We don't have to... Uh, yeah, large spiders do have poison, so... 
if you're running a campaign, put that in this description here. Now watch, it'll show up later and I'm just not paying attention, right? But put it up front and make sure it's known. Put a little note in there about how it works. But my point being, <clears throat> and maybe this is a non-point, right? Maybe it's a non-issue. Poison is a save or die kind of thing. And uh, that seems pretty rough to go up against first level creatures with something that could poison you and kill you. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're a first level magic user, for instance, if this thing bites you, well, it's pretty dangerous already, right? Now, it only does one damage per attack. It's that poison. It is that poison. Poison is relatively weak. Saving throws are made at plus two. That's good. But, uh... Yeah, it's a killer. It's a pretty tough thing, first thing to run into. But you burn the webs, you do three points of damage to it right out of the gate. It's only got six. You hit it one more time. Maybe it's a good place. Uh, and I know, it's you know, first, first level magic user might only have one spell, and if he took a magic missile, he's guaranteed two hit points of damage. Maybe this is a good place. Why give it a chance to bite somebody and kill them? If you can burn the webs, zap it with a magic missile, and roll at least a two so you do three points of damage, that's a thing. Good tactics save lives. So, there you go. Rotting sacks. There are ten moldy sacks of flour and grain stacked here. The cloth, is e the cloth is easily torn to reveal the contents. If all of them are opened in search, there's a 25% probability that the last will have yellow mold in it. Handling it, and handling it will automatically... There's the room, right? No uh, doors. Do, 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 do. Will automatically cause it to burst, and all within 10 feet must save, burst poison, or die in one turn. So another 25% chance that something else that you have to save or die against is in this first room. It might seem like a DM is out to get you. You can dilute the poison and make it painful and impactful for a period of time also. A teaching lesson. Yeah, you're not wrong, depending on how new the group is. True enough, too. But, uh... You know, if you just pick up the books, and this is the sample dungeon, and you decide, all right, well, I'm going to run this the way it's written, and then fill out the rest of it, because it's not, you know, the whole thing isn't written up in here. And uh, you decide, I'm going to fill out the rest of it, and then where the stairs are, I'm going to create my own levels down below and stuff. And you run it as your first adventure with first level characters as your... You and your buddies just picked up the books and it's all you know. You're going to think it's pretty deadly. You're not going to really have the wherewithal to uh, to dilute the poison or whatever. But again, it's a plus two on the saving throw for the spider poison, right? That helps. Uh, another 25% chance of another poison save or die saving throw here. That's pretty crazy. C, by the way, heavy oak door with bronze hardware is remarkable. Only in that, if any character listens at it, he or she will detect a moaning which will rise, then fade away. Unbeknownst to the listeners. It is a strong breeze which goes through area two. As soon as the door is open, a wind gust will extinguish torches and be 50% likely to blow out lanterns as well. 
the wind continues to make the corridor impossible for torches until the door is shut. So, it becomes an exhaust. And that's a neat thing, too. Another good lesson learned there, huh? Lex Buyer, yeah? But, uh... Well, anyway. Sorry about the sneezing fit. I know that ate up a lot of our time today. I'm, uh... Sad that that is the case. However, it is time. And I do have some things I got to do today, so I'm afraid I got to hop. And uh, we'll get back at this next week with part three. We've uh, we've tackled the legend in the first week, and then we got room one in the second week. <laughs> There's always so much detail to actually talk about with these things. And... Uh, I'll tell you, if you're like me, you can't read something that's written for gaming without having a hundred ideas and thoughts on whatever it is with every paragraph. That's just the way our minds work, especially if you're a DM. is uh, You're always coming up with something new and everything you ingest becomes fodder for new ideas. And that's the way it should be, you know, and it helps, uh, I tell you, it helps me to go back and look at this stuff and talk it through as if it's all new because, uh, you know, in a lot of ways it really is, but original plus advanced, keep that in mind because, uh, it's important to realize too, that when this first came out, of course, we already had the Player's Handbook and the Monster Manual, as I said. But then we're, uh, everything that was in this book was new when we got it in 79. So all the stuff that's in here, we were coming out with eyes that had only really played original D&D. Maybe we were adding the new character, player characters and stuff. But uh, all the combat's in... in the DMG uh, it would have been a uh, eye opener that they had different amounts of damage for weapons just that alone right oh we don't roll a d6 for everything anymore you know so all of this stuff we were coming at very new and it was all uh, exciting and what can I say it's fun to look back at it again uh, 46 years later 46 since original 79 41 years later for DMG very exciting anywho thank you very much I appreciate you being here I appreciate if you're here if you follow the channel and chime in on the chat stream because that is how we know you're not a bot and when you're not a bot you get added to our list and when you get added to our list, it's a good thing. Because uh, on that list, we uh, keep track of followers. And once a week, we uh, toss them a little something. Every Not everybody gets it every week, but somebody gets it. Yoda Stein's here. He got himself, uh, he'll be joining us at the uh, virtual game hole con in November. And speaking of Virtual Game Hole Con, keep thinking about submitting events. Even if you only run a little something just to gain some experience. I mean, if you never run anything, and you don't ever want to run anything, then by all means, don't. Join stuff. Just play in stuff. Have some fun. Enjoy yourself. But if you ever have a uh, an inkling that you might want to run something, this is a great opportunity to give it a shot. It's a very forgiving uh, sort of situation, especially this year, 2020. Nobody expects anything to be good about 2020. <laughs> so we are probably going to be in good company too, because I think uh, there are plenty of DMs who've never done anything online before, or they're just beginning to learn how to do stuff online. And that's a good thing too. And then there are other people 
who've only ever done stuff online. And so you'll be running into some people when you're playing and stuff that are crazy good at this stuff. And uh, keep that in mind when you're playing in those games because you'll pick up all sorts of tips. And the rest of the schedule this week, where are we going? GMing tips tomorrow, building adventures on Friday, GM reviews on Saturday, Sunday, the rules retrospective. We've got weekly news and announcements on Monday, Tuesday, cartography and world building. And then, of course, back around the horn campaign discussion on Wednesdays. Thanks again. If you're a follower or if you're just tuning in, we appreciate it. Chime in on the chat screen. Either way, if you're catching up with this on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up. Maybe uh, make a comment. A little constructive criticism. Never heard anybody. Always a good thing. So thanks to everybody. Come join us again tomorrow and every day, 9.30 a.m. from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.